Good afternoon. My name is Gus Steyer, and I am one of the organizers of this year's J. Irwin Miller Symposium, which is the inaugural Yale Mental Health Symposium. I'd like to welcome you all virtually to the Yale School of Architecture in the first symposium of this series, Beyond the Visible, Space, Place, and Power in Mental Health. This evening, we have the second event and first panel of the symposium, focusing on the typology of the hospital. Last Thursday, the symposium opened with a wonderful lecture by Mindy Thompson Fullove, moderated by Elohi Rubin. The discussion covered such topics as repeatedly fractured communities and ended with a heartwarming chorus of Turn on the Love. Tonight, we'd like to get into the nitty gritty of the relationship between architecture and mental health by examining perhaps the most traditional setting of mental health treatment. The built form of the psych psychiatric hospital teaches us how to respond to mental health within society. These buildings have the ability to inculcate positive reflections or conjure images of the mental health institution as a figure of otherness. Early examples of the asylum express an architecture of order and confinement away from the city. As objects hidden from view and excluded from the everyday life of the city, these buildings conjure intangible notions of the hospital. Across the globe, BIPOC communities face inadequate access to care in the health system, including connections with established social services. For these communities, the encounter with inpatient care resources is frequently limited. In 2014, the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey showed that although Black British adults had the highest mean score for severity of mental health symptoms, they were the least likely to receive treatment for mental illness. Where they do come in contact with services, it is disproportionately based on a detention order requiring them to stay in the hospital. Imagining new forms of care demands an understanding of racism and racial discrimination in mental health services. How might progressive models disrupt prevalent perceptions of mental health and improve the experience of clients inhabiting these architectures? During the panel today, please post your questions in the Q&A box and like the ones you'd want to be posed to the panelists. Based on the votes, we will unmute guests at the end, of, at the end to ask their questions directly to the panel. To moderate our panel discussion today, we are very blessed to have Matthew Steinfeld, PhD. Dr. Steinfeld is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor of psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine, the associate director of clinical training at the Substance Abuse Treatment Unit of the Connecticut Mental Health Center, and a psychoanalytic candidate in the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. His scholarly and clinical interests center on the clinical theory and technique of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, the interplay of sociopolitical dynamics and psychological health in community-based treatment contexts, and the acoustic dimensions of psychotherapy. Dr. Steinfeld is an editorial board member of the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association and a board member of Psychoanalysis for Social Responsibility. In 2019, Dr. Steinfeld collaborated with Daisy Ames, principal of Studio Ames, on the design of a community-based mental health clinic, the conceptual underpinnings of which engaged latent factors commonly unaddressed in both treatment and design. Please give a warm welcome to our moderator for the day, Dr. Matthew Steinfeld. Thanks so much, Gus, and also uh, to Mariana for your uh, kind introduction and support. And to those of you joining us, welcome back to the 2020 Yale Mental Health Symposium, Beyond the Visible Space, Place, and Power in Mental Health. I have the honor of moderating the conference's second panel this afternoon entitled The Hospital. We are fortunate to have four panelists who each have unique perspective on how the built form of the psychiatric hospital signals a great deal about how a society responds to the mental health care needs of the people who constitute its community. Hospitals, like other organizations, are systems that inevitably express the power dynamics of a given place and the policymakers who conceive of them. And while the power and its effects, and while power and its effects are ubiquitous, how that power may manifest in different countries, cultures, and settings may differ considerably, helping and or hurting depending on the extent to which those in positions of power can orient to, attune to, register, and respond to those who are in pain. And moreover, the extent to which those in positions of power can orient, 
to the histories of those places that structured those power differentials in the first place. It takes but a look at the state of our world right now to recognize the magnitude of the inequitable distribution of life chances and life spaces across different kinds of bodies and how this has overdetermined inequitable health outcomes. Racism, gender violence, economic inequality, white supremacy, homophobia, heteropatriarchy, transphobia, the list goes on and on. Add to this the differential effects of COVID and climate change, depending on one's social location and demographics, and we have the coordinates to begin to think about which kinds of bodies bear the brunt of these forces. To the extent to which we can acknowledge the reality of these challenges, we can begin to think about remediating them. However, for countries, as well as any system, including healthcare systems, those who cannot register the topography of these inequalities all too often disavow and erase them from their mind, displacing the effects of these realities into the structures of our institutions. The repetition and reproduction of inequity by those very institutions charged with its reduction often follows. Freud reminds us that this kind of repetition can be meaningfully thought of as a form of memory, which could not be represented in mind at the time it was experienced and exists, albeit split off, repeating in action, waiting for someone, or as in today's panel, someones, to come along and translate the hard to think into conscious thought and design. In doing so, the repetitive typology of a given form of suffering can dissipate, leaving space for new modes of thinking, feeling, and collective action. The core theme of our conference, Beyond the Visible, asks us to adopt an interdependent view of the hospital and to analyze beyond what we can see and think to consider who or what has been left out of our canonical thinking about what constitutes mental health care. And in kind, uh, can we think together about what kind of structures, systems, and healing relationships have yet to be innovated that can provide for our fellow human beings? We are lucky to get to learn from our panelists today about how they view the way forward, and I'm excited for the conversation. And with that, uh, please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Kalechi Ubozo. Uh, welcome. Nice to see you, Kalechi. And uh, Mariana, uh, uh, thank you for the video. Kalechi Ubozo is a Nigerian American writer, mental health advocate, and public speaker. She is the first undergraduate ever published in the New York Times. Her story of recovery is featured in O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, and the documentary, The S Word, which follows the lives of suicide attempt survivors to end the stigma and silence around suicide. She has appeared on CBS This Morning with Gail King, presented at Cornell University, and she was featured on the Good Morning America website. A popular presenter and keynote speaker, Mbozo previously supervised mental health programs and led communication operations at a mental health nonprofit organization. She's the co-editor of the recent book, We've Been Too Patient, Voices from Radical Mental Health. We've Been Too Patient is a collection of diverse stories of radical healing and considers the recent movement towards reform in the mental health field. Please join me in welcoming Kalechi Obozo. So, um, for those meeting you for the first time, um, we just met a few moments ago, so it's, it's, it's lovely to connect um, across these, these distances. Um, uh, perhaps you could start by telling us how you came to mental health advocacy. Absolutely, um, and thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm really excited to be here. You know, the way that I entered the mental health field is a little different. I started really uh, when I was in New York. I was a print journalist and I got to hear stories from community members about their experiences, about their traumas and their needs. I also had my own experiences with mental health challenges and issues. And I ended up finding out about legislation in California called Prop 63 that funds mental health specifically um, a lot of money. And I decided, you know, I wanted to do more hands-on work, but with my own lived experience. So I'm someone who comes to this work um, with being being hospitalized and being a suicide attempt survivor. And I heard this new language that I hadn't heard before about peers. So people who have lived experience and also use that to support others um, and they're trained in that work. So I moved out to California and it's been nearly a decade that I've been working in reform and change and in um, nonprofit organizations, uplifting the voices of those who aren't heard and also trying to do a lot of system change. And that's really how I've come to this work um, from the perspective of someone with lived experience. Terrific, terrific. Um, 
on that topic of lived experience, your uh, recent book that you uh, co-edited, um, which everybody can get from your local bookseller, uh, entitled uh, We've Been Two Patient Voices from Radical Mental Health Stories and Research Challenging the Biomedical Model. Uh, would you tell us about it? And perhaps uh, for those that are unfamiliar um, with the term, also what the biomedical uh, for first. Yeah, absolutely. So We've Been Two Patient is a book that I I spearheaded with my co-editor, the lovely LD Green. And really the book was, the idea behind the book is that there's a lot of things written about people who have mental health issues or some call it mental illness. Um, and there's not a lot from our perspective sharing about what our experiences are. So the book in, in theory, we are challenging the bio, biomedical model and it's for those with lived experience, it's for those who are social workers, it's for advocates, and it's really promoting the idea of radical mental health. And why we're interrupting the biomedical model, which is the model of mental illness that really doesn't take into account race, culture, environment, or identity. Um, it's really focused on assessing a condition and treating an illness and modifying brain chemistry with medication, rather, and the treatment of illness is emphasized over the promotion of health because the belief is that health is the absence of the disease, which is really problematic to us because if you're if you're treating an illness, you're not really working with the whole person. You're not integrating their, their person in the space. And also the dynamic is that someone like me wouldn't know what's going on or wouldn't bring, bring in spirituality or my experiences with racism or all of these other things that I have experienced. And I also know what works for me. So uplifting radical mental health. And for some, some folks, it's actually not that radical. It might be the recovery model where um, those who have lived experience partner with their clinicians um, to come up with treatment plans that make sense for them. And then on the other spectrum, it could be more mat radical in terms of those who um, uplift their altered spaces and say, this is who I am and I embrace it. Uh, we don't all agree in the book, which is a beautiful thing about having a collection of voices. We do agree on voice and choice, but in, in the way that we get there, it's very, very diverse. Super helpful to have that working understanding. Um, in your book, um, contributors, I mean, you referred to the diversity of opinions of, uh, on people's experiences in treatment um, contributors analyze and challenge the biomedical model of psychiatric care, um, writing among other things about over-medication, police brutality, involuntary hospitalization, and more. Um, and I'm curious if you could share with us what you learned from um, the breadth of stories um, that architects might benefit from knowing about when they're designing spaces um, that are meant to heal. Absolutely. You know, I think our collective history as those who have lived experience of mental health issues is one steeped in trauma. So we have, we've had a label on us and we've also faced discriminatory treatment. We've been subjected to a variety of treatments like isolation, warehousing, exploitation for labor and entertainment, abuse and neglect, medical experimentation, sterilization, and you know, honestly, legal protections, um, loss of them. So, and I personally, I've lost my job for disclosing that I had a mental health issue. So when we think about the hospital and as a place for us to heal, um, a lot of folks who've had this experience have been not only otherized, but, um, you know, isolated even in our treatment. The places that we've gone haven't felt like healing places. They felt traumatic, if anything. And those aren't the places we got better. In fact, I think it's really important for architects to know, um, especially the ones that are making these beautiful spaces that feel like a home, not feel like a prison. Um, that honestly, in our hospital data and what, what we're learning more is that hospitalization actually increases the rate of suicide attempts in the future. So just being hospitalized because the experience is so traumatic could make someone more likely, um, even if they weren't even thinking about suicide, uh, have that experience later. So I think it's really, really important when we think about creating these spaces that we're not creating prisons. Um, the idea of hospitals were to separate us from society because we were a problem. We're not a problem. So it's like, how do you build a home and, and, and something that actually is 
is fulfilling and we can actually learn and grow together as opposed to we're dumping you away and we're shifting you off so that you're not part of society. And I, I think the other thing for architects to know in particular is that there's all these studies and data, but really connectivity is what keeps people safe. So how do you build spaces that promote connectivity? And also um, there have been a lot of a lot of studies shown that the role of peers, so people like me, people who have lived experience of mental health issues, if you place them inside hospitals, you actually have um, better outcomes for mental health support and treatment. So I think, I think a space can tell you a lot. I mean, if you've gone to a, a certain side of town and you suddenly feel your body tense up because um, there's like a bulletproof um, glass when you enter, it, it, it really, is that a place for healing? No, it's a place you'd want to flee. So why are we trying to get healed in the spaces that are scary? Um, and it's exciting that folks have made places that are beautiful that we can heal in. Uh, in addition to the interconnection or the interdependence of um, spaces, um, uh, part of what you're speaking to is the need for social support, trauma-informed care that, cre that creates relationships in those spaces that can witness, hear, register each other's narratives. Um, and to that end, storytelling um, seems to be a big part of the methodology you bring to bear, to bear in achieving community engagement and finding um, alternatives to um, modes of engagement that traumatize. So could you talk a bit more about um, your activism in creating space for survivors' voice, voices to be heard and how their first uh, hand experiences inform your work? Absolutely. So, I mean, the book was a collection of stories um, of folks who have had various experiences with the mental health system um, and folks who even work in the system and had to be anonymous in these spaces to actually share their stories. Um, and the stories, really stories bring people together. It doesn't matter your nationality, where you're from. We all connect to stories. They're, they're beautiful and they really help us and building out um, building out our stories, um, for, for example, um, I've been doing a lot of like, how do you share your story of survival? How do you describe what your culture has brought? The great thing about stories is you can show up as you are and talk about the things that work for you, right? And it's not necessarily medicalized. It's really focused on um, the strengths that folks have. So storytelling and the way that I look at it that everyone has a health. It's not us and them. Um, it's how we how we build that health together. And with this, honestly, with this global pandemic, we're having more conversations about mental health than we ever had. And especially with the racial injustice, folks are more more open to talking about, wow, I didn't know I needed to cope differently. And how do I even connect with people? And connectivity really scientifically keeps us safer. So stories are a really good way to promote connectivity and also decrease isolation. When I've been in not great spaces and I've heard stories from other folks, that's actually made me feel like, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who's had this experience and also how they get through it. It also builds a network, um, the network that we need to keep ourselves safe um, and to keep us really striving in this work. Terrific. I think we have time for one more question right now. Um, you, since you brought up COVID and um, the disproportionate uh, impact on uh, uh, BIPOC communities and across different economic terrains, across different um, um, uh, 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 communities that experience social marginalization. Um, what do you think the role of the hospital should be with regard to mental health care amid this global pandemic that has disproportionate effects on certain communities? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, it, it's, it's saved it for last. <laughs> of course. Impossible question. Well, so the hospital historically has not served us well um, collectively. And when we think about the di disproportionality of folks, um, you know, BIPOC community having COVID, it's more that our systems treat us disproportionately, not that we, you know, are diagnosed more. It's more that these systems inherently have. Um, have, have challenges with racism. And so I think the first thing is, what have we created and who is it for? Because what's been created has not been spaces for healing. And, and when we think even around mental health, 
it's, it's fine that people are talking more about it, but when they seek help and treatment, like um, Gus mentioned before, is that folks who might have more symptoms aren't seeking treatment. Well, if the, if the treatment is traumatic, why would we go there? So I think the first thing is you have to remove the trauma from the treatment. And that is the way the space is. That's who, deliver, who delivers the service. That's you know, what is funded and how much money it is and how that impacts someone. So people make different choices about how they're gonna get help, whether it be mental health or health, based on finances. I'm not gonna go there because I can't afford it. So it's a, it's a lot of things when we think about what the hospital needs to do. It's more of like, how do you deconstruct it? Because right now it, it's not working. And we're learning that all of the systems that we had in place are not working right now. So why would we continue on the way we've been going? I think it's how do we, how do we build and center the experience of those who have lived experience. That's the big one. If you're trying to serve folks and you're the and no one is there that looks like that community, that's a problem. We have to center lived experience. We have to center BIPOC. We have to center all of our different gender ethnicities and all of these identities. We have to center center them in the work if you really want to change it. And center does not mean tokenization, right? That means they're helping design and create what they want. Um, and that's why I can't answer that question because <laughs> those are all the folks that have to be centered to help create that world. Thank you, Clancy. Okay, so um, I think we'll pause for now and we'll have an opportunity to come back around when all of our panelists can engage together. Um, so, okay, thank you, Clancy. Um, so next up, um, we have uh, uh, a team, uh, Jason Danzinger and Dr. Martin Voss. Uh, Jason Danzinger is a practicing architect focused on user-oriented and conceptually driven design. He founded Think Build Architecture while living in New York at the end of the 1990s before relocating to Berlin in 2000. The name Think Build refers to his core conceptually driven approach, a hybrid academic practical strategy which intentionally blurs the line between research and practice in order to better achieve the goals of his clients. The spaces he designs aim to have a supportive effect on the activities that take place within them, whether for work, play, learning, living, or healing. His office provides complete architectural design solutions and services ranging from new build to adaptive reuse, as well as original furniture, custom lighting elements, and detailed color planning and material construction processes and explorations. Danzinger's projects have been published extensively throughout Europe, and starting in 2015, when he was awarded the BDA Berlin Prize, his work has received numerous uh, commendations and awards. Uh, his partner, Dr. Martin Voss, um, is a consulting psychiatrist at Charité Hospital and St. Hedwig Hospitals in Berlin, Germany. He graduated from medical school in 2001 and since then has worked as a neurologist, psychiatrist, and a researcher in London and Berlin. His main interest and clinical specialty is the treatment of psychotic disorders. In 2013, he founded Soteria Berlin, a psychiatric ward for young people suffering from psychosis that follows an alternative approach originating in the anti-psychiatry movement in the US. The design of the Soteria was executed in an intensive interdisciplinary collaboration with Jason. The user-centered design process included other members of the clinical team as well as former patients and resulted in an environment that truly differs from most psychiatric wards. Inspired by this collaboration, Martin and Jason founded Psychrom an interdisciplinary platform that explores the possibilities of architecture as an integral part of the concept of therapeutics, atmosphere as a therapeutic agent. Please well, uh, join me in welcoming Jason Danzinger and Dr. Martin Voss. Hello. Hello from Berlin. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, and Jason. Hello. Hello, Jason. Hello. Hello. Hi. We're all, we are all here. Welcome. Um, Hello, everybody. Um, so for those meeting you for the for, uh, both for the first time, perhaps you could begin by just sharing how you come to this conversation. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's very exciting to be here. Of course, it would have been much nicer to be in Yale, but um, this is a good opportunity to get something started that hopefully continues over the next month and years. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist here in Berlin at the Charité University Hospital. And the story of Jason and I um, started in 2012 when, when I had the chance, a very unique chance actually, to 
to start to open up a new ward, uh, especially for young patients suffering from schizophrenia. And me and my colleagues, we decided that we wanted to transfer the Soteria paradigm that actually originates in, in the US um, to the hospital. And maybe I, I, I share with you, if I get this started, I share with you a picture of that first um, Soteria House in California. Um, I hope everyone can see this now. Um, this is what it looked like. It was founded by, founded by Lauren Mosher, um, a psychiatrist who believed that and I think this is a very strong quote, there's no worse place to be than a psychiatric hospital when you are mentally ill. And unfortunately, I think we, we all um, may agree that this, um, at least to some extent, is, is still true for many places that we treat our patients nowadays. So what Lauren Mosher tried was a quite a, a extreme uh, way. He went to this nice uh, house somewhere in a, in a quiet neighborhood and started this um, alternative approach and no medication, no, and no antipsychotic medication and more like a community-based um, um, yeah, group of, of patients and, and people that were with them. And we now, of course, we have a classic hospital, but we had a ward that, was, um, that we were asked to, um, to use for this new ward that we were supposed to start. And um, so we, we basically um, said, how can we transform this community approach to a hospital? And I uh, came to the, uh, to, to the conclusion that I need to find an architect who truly comes from a different experience, from a different world. Not, no one who has built in hospitals before, but has done other interesting projects and would understand what we, what we need. We needed a safe place, a place that felt really safe, a place that felt homely and didn't emphasize illness uh, rather than recovery, and a place that um, emphasizes the being together and the being with. So being with is basically the, the headline of Soteria, that we are, we're just spending time with the patients um, rather than right away giving them high dose of medication and, and basically putting them to sleep, we try to endure to live through the acute phase of psychosis together. Um, so I asked Jason um, to, to help us with this. And this is where our um, extremely interesting collaboration started when we, we realized that it is really worth trying, trying a bit more to understand each other's ideas. So Jason had to transform the, the psychiatric service model into um, a, a design concept. And maybe he can take over and, and tell us how he did that. Yeah. Shall I do so? Please. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Jason. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Martin. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I think uh, what, what, what is interesting to me or what was interesting at that moment about the Soteria was the fact that basically it it was sort of like a, a normal place i think what what after we talked about it for many hours and over days we realized that uh what what was actually needed was just a kind of a place to to live that it was it, it was sort of that the successful route would be in trying to create something that was less specialized and um so that's how we started to work we tried to create a space where we would feel comfortable and everyone would feel comfortable. And the basic idea was looking for non-hierarchical um, solutions where, where both patients and therapists of all kinds and families and visitors would, would feel an equal level of comfort. And, that, uh, and, and surprisingly, that was a kind of a new idea somehow in this context. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Could you, could, Jason, could you say a bit more about um, how you guys approached the non-hierarchical nature of this space, um, perhaps in how it was allocated or uh, materiality, um, how you guys approached that from a design perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I think that, you know, most psychiatric hospitals um, 
de definitely work to prioritize the institutional prerogatives. So, you know, institutional prerogatives are very different than, than, um, than, than the prerogatives that might be good for, for, for people who are, are having mental health issues. And I think that the, the point there would be that, you, you know, for example, if beds need to be cleaned, that means they're gonna be on wheels. And if they're gonna be on wheels, you need things protecting the walls against banging on, you know, banging the bed. And so we just decided that we would try to have normal beds with regular feet and people would change the beds and then we wouldn't need wheels and then we wouldn't need protectors on the walls. And so that would kind of work towards normalizing the space. And so that, that became kind of one of the, one of the, the simple ideas for it. And, and another, another thing we did is um, the, the Soteria is, um, has no, uh, it, it has no, um, it has no, uh, it has no special room for the the nurses. You know, in a, in a normal psychiatric ward, you have you have the nurses have a kind of a, like a little uh, in German, it's called the Kanzel. You have like a little space, and it's set set apart. And one of the things we did is we just made a democratic plan. So we we called it internally what you know what what you see is what you get. That you you walk in and you know where the where the nursing staff is, where the doctors are there's a glass door and you can look in and that's where they are. And um, I think Martin can definitely tell more about this, but you know, the moments of giving medicine is there's a discussion with the patients and that happens in, in a kind of a public space. And then in plan, we put the, that, that room, the, the, we call it in German, the open station zimmer, the, the open station room, the open ward room is just right across the hall from the living room. And, it, and it's just like a, another kind of a living room. So it's a normalizing these spaces. Mm -hmm. And there, there are other examples I can tell about if you like, but that was kind of the basic strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Martin, would you like to add? Well, yeah, I think what, what I th you could maybe see also from these pictures and what, what directly follows from what Jason just told us is that we try to um, de-medicalize um, as much as possible, not only um, what the design is concerned, but also certain rituals like, like the medication. Like we, we all know these, everyone who's been to a psychiatric ward knows these moments where patients line up almost and get each their, you know, um, share of, of medication. And we try to do that over the meals um, at the big table that, where we all have our lunch and dinner. And there's one person who's, who's responsible, of course, one nurse, but it is happening in the open and it's happening in a, in a as natural as possible way. Also to destigmatize um, taking medication if it's necessary. And often we also come to then come to some some discussions about side effects or things like that. And um, myself and my colleagues, we, we happen to have lunch or, or, or breakfast together with the patients almost every day. So we're available for these kind of discussions, but in a, in a much more natural uh, way, in a much more normalized way, if you want. Um, so this gives a lot of, um, also I think safety and trust um, and takes away uh, the notion of I'm, I'm stuck here or something. Mm -hmm. And of course, by the way, uh, Sotria is always open yes. though, so there's no, there's no closed, closed door ever. Yeah. So, so a, a tremendous amount of access to, to providers, um, social integration, um, uh, thinking through of details from the contact of the bed to the wall to the contact with your psychiatrist or nurse um, around the dinner table. Um, these are these are moments of meeting. Um, uh, it sounds like. Um, so I'm sorry, I had to share this because it, it makes so much sense right now. This is a quote from Jason Danziger. Um, because when we built Soteria, some people in the in the department within the hospital got really annoyed with us because we we were discussing every doorknob and every every single detail, and we kept saying, "Listen, it's about." the sum of all this, because this is what creates the wholeness. That's, that's what makes it, makes it a place that, that kind of makes sense. And especially for someone who is psychotic and which, whose world is, is fragmented anyway, 
you have a strong need to put things together and create create wholeness um, rather than more fragmentation, which you often find in in classical psych worlds. I, I very much appreciate the use of the term wholeness, inviting your your clients, your patients to show up as they are in the fullness of who they are in contact with other people who were doing the same. And to that end, I wonder um, if in the process of designing an adequate environment for your, your patients to heal, um, how you thought about or um, uh, engaging, engaging issues of race, class, gender, culture, to create a space that would provide um, patients, patients able to show up in the wholeness of who they are um, in the space. Well, it's, it's the, the, the medical uh, model in, in Germany and Berlin is that each psychiatric hospital serves a certain sector of the city or, or um, area. And we happen to serve a, um, a part of Berlin called Wedding, um, which is a very difficult um, area of Berlin. It's an um, extremely high proportion of um, um, low, low social, um, um, so social class, um, high um, percentage of migrants, and a lot of violence already on the streets. There's even parts um, of, of this term where the police um, would, would not really like to go. So this is one of those uh, areas in Berlin that are quite difficult. And that was even more a reason for us to design a, a space that, that, that shows respect and, and gives them a feeling of being welcomed. And, and some patients tell me, wow, this is some, such a beautiful place I've never seen in my life even. And um, I mean, but what else would you like from a hospital where you're supposed to get well? Um, so this is a matter of respect as well, that we provide this kind of um, environment that, that often you only find in private clinics for um, the upper class who is um, trying to get better from their, more from the neurotic spectrum rather than psychotic spectrum. And Jason, for our, our last couple minutes here in this 15 minute uh, segment, would you like uh, the last word on that? Well, Jason I, I always think... has the last word. <laughs> the architect no, no. always has the last word. Yes. Well, it tends to last, but <clears throat> we'll see. In, in, in any event, no, I, I think I'd, I'd like to speak back. I think one thing Kalechi said was really interesting. I mean, there are many things very interesting what Kalechi said, but in, in this specific uh, point, um, there, there was the, the bit about stories and, 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 and how stories are very important and narrative. And, and I think um, one of the things that we really tried to do in terms of, uh, there's a great German word, which is Wertschätzung. That's like uh, providing esteem or respect. So, you know, we're providing respectful spaces and, and the idea of um, kind of stories being tissue are linked because if if the spaces are respectful and they're equally um, offering uh, kind of democratic layouts and democratic spatial or phenomenal experiences with the light and the color then it becomes possible to create new stories and so when Martin and his colleagues are sitting at the table having lunch it's the same there's a, there's a kind of a uh, there's shared stories that are happening and that becomes a connective a connective tissue i think and i think that that's uh kind of one of the roles that that architects can can do is to sort of set the stage for shared experiences and then the the it's not it's it becomes not a space it, it it deinstitutionalizes the institution if you may i mean it becomes it becomes more of a, a destigmatized space that that offers uh, we focus on and I think that's what what we were trying to do and what we tried to do at the Soteria and what we're trying to do in our other projects as well which of which maybe we'll talk about at some point too. I hope so. Okay thank you gentlemen. Um, uh, we'll loop back around in about 15 minutes for our panel discussion um, but next up I have the um, pleasure of introducing architect Christian Carlson. Um, Hello, Christian. Hello. Hello, okay. So Christian <laughs> Carlson is the founding partner of Carlson Architects. Carlson works, uh, Carlson's work focuses in the field of humanistic architecture, 
for what might be characterized as vulnerable populations, people struggling with mental illnesses, the elderly, people with dementia, children with varied challenges, and people without homes. He is engaged in developing new standards and principles of recovery-oriented and healing architecture, and has been responsible for numerous award-winning projects. Especially mentionable is the groundbreaking new psychiatric hospital in uh, Sugis, if I'm saying it correctly, which I'm not, uh, which mm -hmm. is an, an area of 44, which has an area of 44,000 square meters, the largest and most ambitious project for a psychiatric treatment center in more than a century in Denmark. Current ongoing projects include new high security uh, psychiatric hospital in Trondheim, Norway, new psychiatric hospital in uh, Kristensand, Norway, research project Dementsex, and housing and care center projects for people with dementia. Please join me in welcoming architect Christian Carlson. So, hello and welcome. Um, Thank you. Thank you for <clears throat> inviting me. Our pleasure. Um, so for those <laughs> meeting you uh, 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 for the first time, uh, would you uh, also begin by sharing how you come to this conversation and work? Sure. Um, yeah, I started up this, uh, this firm, Carlson Architects, for like 15 years ago. And, and before that, I've been working as an architect and, and a partner in, in bigger firms and I've also been working for, for the government. So I started up with sort of a, a, a broad, uh, wide uh, approach to, to but, but also a, an ambition of, of, of doing good. Um, this particular field actually started up with an ad. There was an ad for an open competition for the most ambitious uh, psychiatry building project in Denmark for like over 100 years. And these, these, uh, these jobs uh, almost never gets out in public so that, you know, it's uh, a narrow um, um, type of, uh, of, of firms that work with these, with these jobs. So, but we saw the ad and we attended and we won the first step and we, uh, we, we, uh, we made a strong team and we won, won the, the job in the second uh, step of this competition. And uh, so that's how I got into working sort of with, with architecture for what we call those who, who needed the most, which are groups in society, which having are struggling with dealing with the real world, you might say, or the normal uh, daily life, family, work, and, 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 and stuff. Um, and that has been sort of a, then an, uh, an important issue in our work for like the, the last 10 years. And it, it turned out that this client was not only writing that he was ambitious, uh, he was very ambitious. They set up as international gold, uh, not a national uh, gold, and wanted to make like uh, an international standard uh, based on the Danish values and methods of working with psychiatry. And the key was, was like the patient is in focus. It's the patient who knows what's going on. And the patient is not a guest in the doctor's uh, office. So um, we had a, an enormous collaboration with the client, with staff and the management. And um, actually we, we didn't find examples, not internationally either in like standards or solutions that could match the, uh, the program that the client had set up. The mm. client couldn't find it either. And so it turned out that we sort of had to define for ourselves what are really the strong values? How can architecture support this process of recovery, of healing? You know, that there's been a lot of work on, on the subject of like education. How can you support children uh, learning stuff and, 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 and other fields? But, but this was like uh, uh, quite new. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in doing that, we, we focused on this process of recovery and sort of started in the end of being well. So, so we started in sort of what we might call normality. Um, what, is, what, what are values for being a human, a human being? What is architecture? What is good architecture? What is important? And then try to 
see it in, in society, analyze it, uh, understand it, and and uh, see how can we use it in in uh, in the buildings that 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 actually ends up with should end up with people being able to leave the building and 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 uh, be a part of society again. It, so it, yeah, it, it sounds like um, uh, you started with a well-formed outcome rooted in. Um, uh, uh, Values and ethics around what it means to be a human being. Yeah, sure. What yeah. architecture is. Could you walk us through the design process a bit from um, from uh, trying to build such a massive structure without um, uh, precedent, uh, yeah. certainly in Denmark, and, and making it to that um, well formed outcome? Yeah, the, the process would be this collaboration um, and um, we sort of designed the process ourselves. We, we, we set up demands or askings for, for the client uh, in this collaboration, collaboration um, like you should end up being a part of the organization. Um, we should have a, have a diversity from very young people, maybe students uh, and older knowledge uh, people in the staff. We should have including patients, of course. And we try to, we try to you know the client should not give the answers they should they should sort of give the problems the questions so our job is to to ask uh, or have a process where we get into what are the real problems and then it's also is to sort of balance this knowledge that you have and there's a lot of knowledge of, of, about how it what works and doesn't work from experience but have it balanced with sort of the new opportunities that we haven't seen yet sort of the vision, you might say. And, and it's, it's typical for many people and that change uh, is the same as you're losing something. You're losing something you know, you're taking chances. So our job in this process was to um, make it like a, a readable, understandable, that is more a, a possibility that you can gain new uh, solutions than that you lose some and that's basically by a lot of meetings, meetings and meetings. Mm -hmm. and, and a quite specific uh, process, as I said, we, we had meetings with, with the management, um, the CIA, CEO, like uh, every two weeks to ensure that all the knowledge we got was that we were on the right way and, and, and that the management ideas and the political ideas also came into to the process uh, from their side. And I assume along the way that you were also meeting with uh, families, patients, physicians, uh, various stakeholders, or or not. How did how did you integrate the varying uh, needs of the people that would be using that space in the design process? I think it was there were not that many meetings. We had meetings with with organizations, and there were specific uh, like uh, uh, experienced persons that would participating also in the beginning in the, in the, uh, the process of, of uh, choosing uh, in the competition. So they, they, they were along all the way, uh, but it was not like that we um, took in larger groups of patients, but the focus was always from the client to have the patient in focus, but it is kind of a translation, of course, that the experiences uh, is observed by more by uh, the staff and the competence persons. This is a possible so that's both general and forensics and also high security. So there's a, a widespread of, of, uh, of um, uh, like uh, questions and, and problems that you are, you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And some of them makes it more obvious to work with patients than others of, of course. Sure. A couple of questions about um, the architecture. Um, in an article in the Architecture Review, uh, John Asbury comments on the profound effect incorporating a public route that cuts right through the center of the hospital, saying, mm. quote, uh, what is a small step structurally is here perhaps a huge step in terms of what a simple line of sight can bring to patient and public relations. And as I'm sure most artists or architects know, a line is not just a straight line uh, yeah. ever. Um, can you elaborate a bit on how the hospital challenges typical relationships between the public and the patient or how much, and how much freedom 
uh, did you have as an architect uh, to, to advance uh, mm. this aesthetic, aesthetic vision? Mm. Sure. I, th I think we, the, the ambition from the client gave the possibility of, of having an unusually uh, large um, freedom and 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 uh, sort of impacts uh, on the project more than I have experienced before. There was a lot of trust and a lot of of uh, wish for for stepping further than than you had done before. It's about the uh, it's about this, the 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 uh, the public access to the houses. One of the issues is. Uh, trying to deal with the stigma um, in society that we give access. Uh, it's a public access through the house and you can answer the, the cantina where staff and patients uh, can, can, can eat. You can't get, of course, to more uh, in inclusive, uh, exclusive uh, areas, but you can sort of, you can book uh, meeting rooms and stuff. So it's, mm -hmm. it tries to open up to also because it is and, 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 urban uh, environment it's um, it's not anymore just uh, hidden away in apart from the city so it's natural to 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 open up and i think it's used um i know it's used to, we come there sometimes still and have have have, uh, have different kind of discussions down there so but also this this uh, this park that is part of the of the of the project is this a public park and uh, like path for for running or bicycling, and it's it's used, and and that sort of takes out the 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 stigma of, of of this house. I can say one thing that we had an opening just before we really opened with patients, we invited like the neighbors to to come and see what has been going on for like last three years, and it was a Saturday, and I went down there not to do anything, just to show some of my friends how it was was done, and there came like ten thousand people. There was a line down to the to the center of the city. It was wow. like a musical festival. We don't know really why, but it was amazing. We had to call in staff and and you know uh, try to to make this work. Um, so it seemed like we could say yes to this. The public is a part of this uh, hospital actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, final question in our last couple of minutes. Um, we only have two or three minutes left before we come to all the panelists. Um, but my understanding is that this hospital is located close to uh, the somatic hospital mm. and together they constitute um, a cohesive health campus um, with shared access mm. of roads and adjacent parkland. Um, mm. And could you talk just very briefly about the challenge of creating a new facility with a new model of psychiatric mental health care uh, that required integrating it in with an existing structure as we're thinking about um, the transition from existing structures to new models uh, mm -hmm. of thinking about what constitutes mental health care, why people suffer, what can be done about it. Can you talk just a moment about um, the relationship between the old and the new? Yeah, this, this hospital uh, in Slails is, is all new. It's, it's a part of an, 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 an hospital urbanism or campus, you might say. So there's no sort of conflict there, but we have also done uh, projects in older buildings. And I think it's a, it's a common uh, uh, approach that you say, when you have an old hospital, you can always use the old building for psychiatry because the new ones, they need so, so much wiring and stuff. And that's very wrong. But when you, when you work with the older buildings, you should not uh, give up the basic values that you work with. You still have to get you know, the best of daylight and access to out, out, outside the areas and, 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 and these values that we work with. And that is possible, but it is of course a question of money. But I think it, the best is, basically we always try to recommend that psychiatry hospitals are in, in one story, storage that you can, it's not a, a high rise. Uh, you should be able to get in and out in various ways to ensure the empowerment of of being uh, hospitalized. It's not all, always possible, but it's quite important um, that you do not put it into to more complicated building structures, in my opinion, if you can avoid it. Yeah. Great, okay, well, thank you, Christian. Okay, so um, may I invite back uh, Jason Kalechi Martin 
um, uh, for uh, a longer discussion. And um, while we're all coming back, um, thank you in advance to um, uh, Gus and Mariana for aggregating questions. Um, and after a few questions, uh, a little bit of discussion amongst the panel, um, I'll look to you to um, uh, feed me a couple of them. So thank you in advance. So um, to begin with, I'm, I'm curious to turn to you guys and ask if there are themes or things that uh, one or several of you said that you'd like to respond to. Well, I, I wrote down one quote from you, Christian, that I really liked um, because I have experience in this. You said clients should not give the answers, they should give the problems. And this is so true. And I find myself often in the opposite uh, position. Mm. I, I was attending several meetings where it was about designing new wards or things like that. And, and they call it user involvement. But what in fact it was, they were showing us a floor plan and then we were shifting around offices, uh, spaces and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And actually trying to give design solutions. And um, with Jason, and I actually really experienced the opposite. He was just listening and he was even a silent, um, a silent person on the ward, one of our wards for one day, um, just to mm -hmm. observe. And out of these observ uh, observations came several design ideas that we incorporated in the in the ward. Mm -hmm. So this is really, I think, such an important issue. And unfortunately, it seems to also mm -hmm. be very, very rare that you find this yeah. kind of inter interdisciplinary interaction, really both ways. But I agree, it's, uh, it's so important to, to sort of take responsibility for, for having this process. And, and I have heard several times, uh, I think Alessia talked about like, it should like home, use the word home and homely. And, and, and that's one thing that we do not do. We try to get sort of beneath these preset um, words, because what is, when you talk about home like a quality, we try to find what are these qualities so we can sort of split up the qualities of home and, and put them together again in a hospital, uh, hospital um, um, situation. So is it, is it because of, yeah, do you know things that you think it's nice? Is it because it's small? Is it because uh, the people you know? What is actually homely? And when you take these discussions up, you get a whole new set of, of sort of words and, and, uh, and, um, and can have a discussion that takes you further than you were before. And that's, I think is really important because we don't want to make a home like it was or like you know, but we want to make maybe it's, it's just as, as nice as what to think about when you say home, if your home is nice. Yeah, it's would not, not like hospital. <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe the better word is safe, um, safe yeah. to heal. And the, the places that you all described and that you've all created, the light, the no closed doors, the openness, that is nothing that I've ever experienced in a hospital. Mm -hmm. All closed doors and, and fear. So I think when you integrate the patient perspective and the design um, and, and highlight the problems that they've come up with, but also some of the solutions. And maybe we're not all architects, but we do know what makes us feel comfortable. And yeah, comfortable. sure. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that um, uh, the question of safety that Kalechi was uh, foregrounding earlier and about um, healing space is not traumatizing. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> to take the trauma out of the treatment. Um, uh, the, a lot of it sounds like the plans that you have um, uh, worked with, uh, Martin, Jason, Christian, involve creating um, the kind of social, uh, shared social spaces, social integration that Kalisha was talking about are so crucial in terms of social support, being able to bear witness to one another. I'm wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about the, the tension between privacy um, uh, and uh, communal space. Um, uh, the desire for space where people can connect and how you think about providing spaces that, that are private rather than confining, uh, that can support someone's agency 
um, as opposed to removing it. Yeah. I, I think that um, one thing that's, that's, that's been a great model for us is, I, I think there's a lot of archetypes for, that people sort of intuitively understand uh, on a community, almost sort of like uh, the, the, the village structure and metaphors about s smaller communities uh, can be used very effectively, I think, in, in hospital or in, in spaces for healing. So um, if, if, if we start to think about hallways more as like uh, streets, smaller streets and, and having porches, I think these kind of metaphors work very well because they're, I think anything that can happen to um, offer sort of uh, activation of these common shared spaces, the liminal spaces are really important, I think, in, in, in any health environment, whether it's a somatic or a, a psychiatric uh, kind of a condition. So I think that trying to make things that feel a little bit like a porch, you know, sort of wider spaces or irregular spaces become sort of spaces where you can step back and watch and maybe have a little bit of safety um, without, without it being a big deal, you know? So spaces of retreat, places to watch, be seen sometimes if you want. I think these metaphors work rather well. I would, I would, I would, like, to, I would just like to comment on something that Kalechi just said, which I find very interesting. You said you want a place that's safe. And that's interesting because uh, safety as a notion can be interpreted in very different ways. And most of the times, all the hospitals that are being built, um, they would say, yes, we're safe. It's a, it's a very safe place, but that's uh, safety taken from, from a per perspective of the institution and the, and the doctors. And it feels awful to be in those safe places. And this is certainly almost the opposite of what you probably meant when you said you want a safe space. So um, this is, a, I think, a very important issue to talk about. And we need more kalechis in those type mm -hmm. of discussions, you know? <laughs> well, I want to just hop in right quick into this, say thank you, yes. And when I mean safe, I mean safe for the person who is experiencing mm -hmm. it, right? Exactly. Um, safe for the patient um, or client. Um, you brought up a really good question earlier, Matthew, about private or not private, like public. And, and I just imagine what Jason was saying about having porches or places where people can commune. One of the things we found in one of our studies when I was at uh, Peers, Peers Envisioning Engaging in Recovery Services that was funded out of, out of Alameda County, they did a pilot project where they had peer support, peer support specialists paired with someone who was going to be leaving the hospital. And they had all of these folks kind of visit them while they were in the hospital. Now, their outcomes were incredible. It decreased rehospitalization by 68%. But what was interesting that wasn't planned was that because the peer supporters were coming into the hospital, they had to change the visitation hours for everybody to make the vision, visitation hours um, more accessible and have longer hours, which actually impacted everyone's mental health in a more positive way because they were able to connect with their loved ones. And that was just, you know, a happy accident. So what are the ways that you can promote connectivity, even by accident, by having folks access people they want to see while they're mm -hmm. in the spaces? We talk about the, uh, I think it's called in English, a hierarchy uh, in space. Um, because in this process of recovery, the demands, the needs for, for, for the hospital from the patient side is actually really, really different from the situation where you are hospitalized and are very, very bad, and maybe there's a social uh, um, um, possibility and stuff. And then at another point, you are leaving the hospital. I think it's not a, a straight line. I know that it's quite complicated, but it is actually what the process is about. And so the house, the building that you are in should actually be able to provide very different kind of space and, and sort of stimuli and activity possibilities during this process. And I think a lot of houses, they only focus on a few of these aspects and, and often mainly this classical security problem, like, like the, the bulletproof glass wall you mentioned. And, and I think security, the way we work, it is much more like a dynamic uh, 
uh, where everybody sort of participates uh, and uh, alone this that you have possibility of seeing other people and seeing staff that you can trust <coughs> close by and you know what's going on and that you have access uh, yourself to different it's not locked doors um, you know if you think if you think like you have some special jobs to do if you think that you are like jesus and 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 uh, there are voices in your head and in, in the worst cases it's not cool that that you can't get into the garden or get to the bathroom if you want to you that's a no that starts up and a negative situation you have a violent situation so it's very much about avoiding all these negative things and trying to make it open and easy to read and and have uh, everybody is like um, uh, accessible uh, when you when you need it but at the same time have from this very very um, uh, no stimuli uh, space to uh, the spaces where you can have activities and social activities during this process of recovery that's very important to be aware that the house is many things you eat alone you eat together you eat in the cantina you eat in the garden um, and and all these processes uh, that you have in the daily daily living should be accessible in with a variation of space and and impact from people and 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 architecture you might say mm -hmm. choices and options giving folks those yeah. simple I want to just uh, uh, loop back to Martin's uh, point and uh, maybe uh, Kleche as well about safety um, and, and the multiple perspectives from which we might be able to think about what constitutes safety, which vantage point we're thinking about it from, and whether a person before they've uh, gone into a hospital feels safe in their neighborhood, the country they live in, under a particular political regime, what their immigration status is. Um, these um, impact in varying degrees the extent to which somebody believes or experiences that safety is possible, um, uh, whether it is possible, whether it's impossible, and which might um, affect the, um, the experience upon meeting in a, in, in a unit or a ward. So I was curious if you guys wanted to just uh, say a bit more about safety, which seems so central to um, centering a client's experience and really taking the time to understand it as Martin, you were, you were talking about around the table in the Soteria uh, where clients have access to their providers over food, um, as opposed to um, uh, chasing people down in hallways that are not streets that don't have porches. Well, I think safety is uh, a topic that, that, that is basically we are, we're dealing with every day also as psychiatrists. And of course, uh, we want to um, try and minimize certain risks of suicide on the wards or something like that. But I think it's almost like an inverted U-shape curve. You can increase safety by removing certain obvious points that, that like knives or something like that, that are in the open and they almost like create an affordance to, to, to do something violent with them if you're in a psychotic, like we, we mostly deal with patients in an acute psychotic state. But then there's also the point where if you have reached a certain level of, uh, of, of safety, it, it tips again and you go uh, down again because if you, make, if you create a space that's completely sterile and someone who who's in there loses all hope and all trust in himself, herself or, or anyone else, then you would increase the risk of something happening on the ward. Everyone will find something to do, um, to do himself or herself harm if, if there's really a strong urge. And, and that's what we're actually trying to work with. We're trying to minimize that urge or that, that, that strong, um, yeah, that, that, for example, wanting to um, end your life by, by suicide. Um, so there's so many, on, on so many levels we can work and, and just removing uh, curtains because you can strangle yourself with them is, is kind of a ridiculous idea to think that you can uh, minimize risk, I think. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, I think safety is different from discomfort um, because it's not a comfortable situation being in certain spaces when you're not at your best 
but do, do folks have belief in me? Are they afraid of me? Are they acting afraid? That is going to impact how I engage with someone or how a client might engage with someone. Um, and removing all the sensory items, right? Like healing is like, maybe it's smelling lavender. It's like, what, where do you incorporate color and the things that soothe folks? Um, and then how do you, you know, I think a lot of folks think about how do they protect their staff. Um, but if we were to go in into more of a partnership of here's the do's and don'ts, here are the things that will be removed. What is a trauma-informed way to let you know how we act in this space, right? How do we orient you uh, to this space together? Because you're not at your best. And when I'm not at my best, you know, I might not have everything together, but I do want to feel like I'm held. Um, and I think another thing to add is I've gone, I've gone to different 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 facilities and I've seen um, a hospital that was really open that, you know, yes, people were coming in um, not at their best, but the, there was almost imagery everywhere about you can get better, hope and recovery. Like you felt safe there. And I went to a similar place across the street that was supposed to be for urgent care, but they had all of these like um, just the glass, the bullet, bulletproof glass, and no one was accessing, ser accessing services because they were afraid because the fear was so loud. It was like, I'm not going to go in there. They actually were going into the wrong place because the staff were welcoming. The imagery was kind, even though there was something that was actually cheaper somewhere else, but because of how it felt, they were not receiving services there. So it's definitely a, lar a, larger, a larger conversation that I wish we could have more time to speak about. Sure. Thank you guys for your thoughts. I think, um, Gus, if you're with me, we're going to uh, open it up to um, uh, folks' questions. Um, and the first person to ask a question is Gail Lemieux. Uh, so Gail, if, um, I, I think um, Gus will unmute you and if you could ask your question. Sure. Thank you. This has been a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, I work at a large uh, psychiatric hospital in New England. And one of the issues that we are facing along with many US hospitals are the very strict uh, government and uh, various regulators around safety. And some of these regulations are to the point, they are, in my opinion, and a lot of my colleagues ridiculous in that we are forced to make changes that minimize our ability to create a healing and warm environment. And it's very uh, frustrating because we can't do that. And I'd be very interested in anyone's opinion and how we can reach, um, this, this is actually at a federal level, to try to make some changes so that um, we can uh, have more ability to create the kinds of environments that you're speaking about and that we know are beneficial for patients. Thank you, Gail. Panelists. Well, if I should give an answer from our any situation, it is, it is a matter of the, of the client's uh, approach, in, in my opinion. Um, I don't know so much about the American funding of, I guess it's uh, some public and, and some, some private and, and, and often it's, it is uh, private organizations that can sort of move uh, uh, and, and, and challenge uh, regulations more than, 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 than the public. Um, but it's, um, it's also a matter of, of bringing together these competences and then making documentation about like we can do from this hospital, especially, especially about the high security wards that we can see a decrease of, of violence by like 90% or something. And we can see a, 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 a medication and, 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 and stuff. We can, we can measure that it's, it, it works. And so that becomes evidence that can be usable in, in, in the discussion, in the more political um, environment. Yeah, uh, maybe I add on to what you're saying, Christian, if I can. I, I think it's, it, you know, s safety is, is absolutely a tremendous issue, of course. And I think it's, it's, it's a, uh, uh, Martin and I have spoken about this a bit, that safety is kind of a projection and 
it's a, it's also a question of uh, safety for whom. You know, is it safety for uh, the patient or is it safe for the institution <laughs> or those working in it? And and that becomes uh, really as from as a design issue, um, it really becomes something that that we have to find a balance of. You know, and and how can we provide you know, the, the, the whole goal of the exercise, the whole goal of having uh, a, a psychiatric hospital is in order to promote mental health. And if, if those spaces themselves are, are as Gail was uh, pointing out, if those, those spaces are damaging, then it's not, it's not, it's not uh, achieving the ultimate goal. You know, and, they're, they're, it's, and then in the end, it becomes sort of a question of detail. You know, if you, if you don't have curtains, then uh, you're not going to have, uh, no one's going to strangle themselves with the curtains. But if you don't have curtains, you're going to have uh, a problem of, um, you, you know, those spaces aren't normal. Not that everybody has curtains in their house, but people have just normal stuff. And if you don't have normalized stuff, then you're not going to be providing destigmatized spaces. And if you have stigmatized spaces, then people are going to have an affordance to act in a stigmatized manner. I, I don't know if that answers your question, Gail, but I'm, I, I, maybe that's a kind of a direction to start thinking. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, the, the notion of uh, institutional fear uh, creating endless regulation. Uh, so when we're talking about safety and fear, who's projecting onto what and when? Um, and what are the, the signs and symptoms of that fear that get folded into the institution? Um, okay, uh, Kletcher, did you want to... Just a real quick thing. I don't have the exact answer, but I do know it's really expensive for people to cycle in and out of hospitals for any city or county. And just that expense, the human expense, but if folks aren't so interested in, I don't know, the human expense, the actual cost of it, um, it is it is a way cheaper to provide healing spaces where people do better and can re-enter the community than it is to have people going in and out. So that is always an argument for um, thinking about you know, regulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Belen Bas Luis, um, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, Belen, uh, please feel free to ask your question. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It has been a very in interesting talk, but my question is for Kelchi. Um, do you think that one way to shed light on the emergence of the mind or um, on of design is to promote autonomy in architectural design because in my case I am architect specializing in accessibility and I think that I can say that uh, the architecture barriers uh, influence a lot in the health uh, of the people so uh, the accessibility uh, considers the physical, the cognitive, the sensory, the organic design, and I would say, I would even say the social design. So accessibility means giving access to people in all the aspects. Um, I believe uh, that if in our head, in if in our mind. Uh, is the idea of considering people with disabilities, elderly people, people with some disease from another culture or gender differently uh, from ourselves in the design proce process, uh, yes, they lose uh, uh, and their family. But I think that the mental health of the environment of the old people will also uh, lose out. So this is all and um, i want to know your opinion and i shut out <laughs> thank you it's like a, a question in a in a advocacy moment at the same time which is beautiful um so i am not an architect at all uh, but what i do know is that if you have expertise in how to make inclusive spaces for folks with disability and even christian spoke to this on a different call when he talked about um the way that you even might uh, for folks who are experiencing dementia, um, and he'll talk more about that, but you can't just color all the buildings differently because that doesn't mean anything to them. So you have to understand what, what accessibility means to the folks most impacted and should architectures work with the folks most impacted to create spaces that work? Absolutely, I think that's, 
the whole point of this conversation um, and the, the architect and the design that has been created here that I wish that I had gotten to experience when I was, when I was in these places. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a question from Thomas de Machot uh, to any panelists. Uh, Thomas, uh, do you want to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So, hi. So the question is um, to, to any panelist, architecture is often presented by its practitioners either authentic, authentically or cynically as the realm of the ineffable, the atmospheric, the mysterious, the magical. Um, and often there is magical thinking for worse and sometimes even for better, um, especially in reference to a subjective experience like that of beauty um, and what beauty can do. How can this magic be better reconciled with the evidence-based or empirical mindset of healthcare institutions? so-called evidence-based design, learning from evidence-based healthcare, has been one way that architecture has learned. But what can healthcare learn from architecture is a practice that tries to establish through obsessing with tangible and quantitative objects, transcendent and qualitative subjectivities. And then I added to that thought, um, one concern is that some of what we experience as beauty or as homeliness can be not universal, but especially a matter of indisputable taste, very specifically grounded in personal, cultural, and social experience, even or especially of marginalized communities. So is there a moral hazard in systematizing um, um, or institutionalizing or universalizing some of these ineffable qualities? That was the disaster that was the work of um, Christopher Alexander. Um, however reliable our intuition that these things are helpful and indeed universal. Thank you. Thomas. Well, Thomas, did you write all this while listening to us? That's impressive multitasking, I, actually. Well, thank you so much, Martin. I think it contributes <laughs> to uh, the, 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 the beauty of listening to you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, I I think this, is, this is so much, so much stuff that we can, t we can talk about forever. Um, I, think, I think you're right. There's so many things that we still need to work on, and, and Christian mentioned that earlier. What, what do we mean by homeliness? What, what does it actually mean? Because it's obviously, it is a very individual thing. Yet, right. we all know what it not means. And, and that's also something you can start from. Because um, I think everyone would agree that a classic high security standard uh, psych ward is, is absolutely not what, what we would call homely. And, and, and maybe mm. we, can, we can deconstruct it from there. That's one 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 quick comment I have, and and the other comment is um, atmosphere is also an extremely difficult um, difficult term, and that also needs to be deconstructed. But I think we can, and and we just have to think it and talk about it, um, especially when we're designing hospitals. That that atmosphere that we're creating is actually a function that we're creating like uh, things like easy maintenance or things that, that are also important, but um, atmosphere, what kind of an atmosphere do we want to create um, can be at least is, is something worth thinking about when you interact with the, with the users. I think it's, uh, this is uh, about beauty, if I understood it correctly, that's also quite difficult to describe, but <laughs> you can try to, to take it apart and, 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 and sort of find what is underneath. And I think it's very important to recognize that, I, I wouldn't say that we are animals, but there's, there are some things in, in being a human being that is uh, quite precise, actually, of how, how, much, how far can we see, how much light do we need for seeing and understanding. Try to stand in an elevator, uh, not COVID, uh, corona, corona wise, but also in general, you know exactly in centimeters when you're too close to another person. And that's mm. also, you know, when you are too far from a person, it's a little dark in the street, you can't recognize uh, what gender or you, you imagine stuff. It's about getting the right data somehow that you need to understand and then be able to act. I think that's quite basic. 
and security and, and well-being and and also beauty comes out of out of having the right uh, information um, but i think as i have heard it a lot of situation where you couldn't care less about beauty or anything you just want to be left alone it's very difficult in your head and then it starts uh, to change and if you can find a spot uh, by where the sun breaks through uh, and the the wall behind you gets a little warm and you feel a life is worth living and mm -hmm. if you can sit in, in a place like like um, um, like described before that you can see what's going on you don't have to participate and and and, and stuff like that um, that's how you can arrange that architecture and you can my kind of beauty but quality is, is a part of of sort of basically daily living when you are in a situation like we're talking about yeah. specialized yeah um <laughs> If if I may, I I think I would fully agree. I think that um, maybe th there might even be a level below archetypes, where where it's just about just phenomenology directly, sort of like applied phenomenon, what what you experience or what we all experience. And I think um, I think Min Mindy was talking about that also in her lecture, or the keynote. Um, the idea of one of consciousness and maybe you could, it might be possible architecturally to provide sort of cues or, or phenomenon which can be experienced uh, uh, for everybody somehow you know even if it's if it, you were talking just now Christian about the light maybe the way the light hits hits a windowsill or the or the edge of a, of a window and if if color bounces off it that's one of the phenomenon that Martin and I were working with and everyone experiences it somehow, no matter what state they might be in. And so that's something that can be shared. So maybe there's a kind of a, a lower level experience that we are all having as humans, whatever, wherever you're at, wherever you are, it's still something centering for, for everyone. And maybe that could be something that's not about beauty. It's just about experience. Mm. And then the interpretation happens afterwards. Matthew, sorry, do we have time? You. Do we have time for another comment, or shall we move yes, on? Yes, I, I was just going to say sorry for interrupting you, Jason. I think just in the interest of time, we have time for one more sure. question, um, and um, that will come from uh, Sanjana Panda. Uh, and uh, Sanjana, if you're there, uh, please feel free to ask her a question. Am I audible? Hello, welcome. Yeah, hi. Hi, so my name is Sanjana. I'm an architecture student in Mumbai in India. I'm actually doing my architectural thesis on uh, new modes of mental health care in the city. So my question is, uh, so uh, Kirichi, you spoke about connectivity and peer support as a major factor in fostering spaces for mental health. What are the, so my question is, what are the kind of psychosocial and peer interactive interventions that can be introduced in a community? community. My question is to everyone on the panel. So could you please elaborate on new modes of mental health care that can be incorporated into the city? So uh, at present, mental health is thought of as purely a disease and it follows a biomedical bias. How does one create architectural interventions which engage with everyday stresses, anxieties, loneliness uh, as an urban design strategy? And what is the role of architecture in in mental well-being of the citizens and so it's imagined as if uh, there is an institutionalization of mental health but then what about what is an architect's role in the idea of mental well-being of a person that's my question thank you thank you Sanj. thank you uh, i'll take the piece about interventions and leave the architect to the other <laughs> other folks um but also i know martin has probably some things to add so you asked about what are the types of um kind of interventions that might exist or that are new one that comes up in our book is um the idea of decruit and that comes from stephen wolfert and alicia ali of nyu and the idea was that they actually utilize Shakespeare as an intervention um, in storytelling. So what 
and this is specifically for veterans, but I think it could work. I mean, I think you can adapt this for different folks, but the idea is that um, veterans would learn a monologue um, and then they would share it with each other and then they would create their own monologue out of their own trauma and their narrative. And each person would perform someone else's monologue. So it's a way to witness and share. There's also, it's in a group support dynamic, which is something that could happen definitely happen in a hospital if you had a facilitator come in and support the kind of conversation. Um, and really the idea is that the personal trauma and the monologues are shared, but there's also talking about resiliency and healing. There's also wellness recovery action plan groups, which is not new. They're, they've been done, done everywhere, but the idea is to identify what are the things that folks struggle with, um, what are some folks' triggers, and have that kind of communal conversation. Um, but more alternatively, there's something called T-MAPS um, that comes from Sasha um, alt bullman in our book as well, where he talks about where do you actually map your resiliency and your skills, and that can really be focused more on culture because resilience it can be a word that is misused in many places, especially in communities of color. So by resilience, we don't mean like, you know, um, pull yourself out by your bootstraps, but actually what is keeping you well? What has kept you well? What, is, what do you learn from your ancestors that you can bring into different spaces? Um, other organizations do this with music, with art. It's a way to integrate things in an engaging way so you don't feel like you're wasting time in a hospital setting, just waiting till you get out. Um, so how do you make that engaging and exciting for folks and also meaningful? Um, I'll pause there. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you, you wonderful panelists. Um, Christian Carlson, Kletchu Bozo, Jason Danzinger, Martin Voss. Thank you to Gus and Mariana for endless work and uh, technical support. Um, for those of us um, here in New Haven, we're grateful to your um, uh, uh, wisdom for sharing it with us. Um, thank you very much for sharing your personal stories and your design clinical life um, successes and, um, and uh, uh, journeys. And to those of you guys um, who joined us on this call, we wish you well uh, amidst the various stresses and struggles of the moment and hope you and your families are healthy and well. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you at the next um, panel in this conference, which is Thursday, September 17th at 6.30 p.m. in the evening Eastern Standard Time. And that will be the home panel. Uh, so this conference is moving through various typologies um, from the hospital to the home to the city the architecture, um, and uh, a real pleasure um, to get to participate in this conversation with you all. Thanks so much. Yep. Okay. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.